Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm joined here with uh, author and thought leader, Mike Griffiths. Um, I've, I'm so excited because I, I used his book, uh, which we'll reference a, a bunch here today, uh, when I passed uh, the PMI Agile Certified Practitioner exam um, and got you know so much value out of, out of his writings and, and my own study. Uh, and we recently had a, a fun conversation together about you know what would make studying for these sorts of exams uh, and changing behavior, becoming an Agile certified practitioner in real life, but what would make that more effective? And so uh, today we're gonna kind of recreate that conversation um, and hope to kind of have a nice fun back and forth. Um, but Mike, why don't you give a, a short introduction and then in, in a change up to some of the other live streams that I've been doing, I'm gonna have Mike ask some of the questions so that we can recreate that conversation just as best we can. Yeah, thanks, Christopher. And uh, for sure, I think it's going to be me asking you the questions today. So uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, my background is that I've been involved in agile approaches for software development for oh, a long time now, since 1994. And um, more recently, since about 2000, working with the Project Management Institute as well, about trying to get some more agile content included in their project management certifications. And so I was involved with creating the Agile Certified Practitioner exam and written a couple of books for it. And more recently, you know, with, with everyone working from home, I've been trying to transition my training that previously used to be in person with lots of um, exercises and we run lots of simulations. I've been trying to do that conversion to, um, to online and electronic learning. And, and as I researched, well, how do you do that? You know, I came across um, Alan Interactions uh, and lots of great information from your site. And, you know, we got in touch and, and I was asking you questions. And it, and it got me thinking about the whole, well, how do we study for exams and, and, and how do we best prepare? Because it's been a long time since I was in school. And, uh, and back then it was all about reading and rereading and maybe highlighting or, or making lots of notes and then doing um, simulation questions or practice questions and exams. And so, you know, I wanted to ask you, first question was, is, is that really still the best way to, to learn? You know, it's been a long time. What's, what's evolved in, in learning and preparing for exams? Right. Well, you know, exams are interesting uh, in, in a lot of ways. And if you think back to uh, maybe a college experience or high school experience, um, you know, we put a lot of pressure and our, our brains are actually pretty efficient at helping us do, do some cramming up front, but they're even more efficient at dumping information and allowing you to move on to the next thing. Um, and so when, when you think about, you know, what's going to make you more successful in taking exams, um, I like to think about, well, what happens after the exam first? <laughs> and after the exam, you kind of have this, uh, real sigh of relief. Oh, I'm glad I don't have to do that again. And I think in a lot of ways, if you ask students, you know, a couple of weeks after they took an exam, but, you know, maybe three or four weeks after that, would you want to take that exam again? And a lot of people would say, no, you know, no way. I, I've kind of forgotten a lot of that. Um, so there's, there's a couple of techniques uh, in studying for uh, questions that, that I'd like to run through. And um, one of them's, you know, from my own childhood and, and we'll pull up flashcards. So uh, this is a nice way of showing something that we can do with the computer um, to create individualized learning so that you work on parts of um, a, a book of content that you individually struggle with. When you sit down and take a full practice exam, um, you know, and, and they're really helpful to do, and I, I think you've provided a number of them in the, in the book um, when I went through it, and I found them really, really helpful to have that, that full breadth. Um, but there are some parts of the exam I, I've got down pat. And there are other parts of the exam I don't know very well. And so uh, the corrective feedback paradigm is one really simple way um, to help students work on parts of parts of a exam that they personally struggle with. Um, and it's really easy to do. So I've, I've got a stack of flashcards here. And um, these are Dr. Seuss flashcards helping little kids with with shapes and colors. And, um, you know, so on the back, there's, there's the answer. So this one happens to be a, a red heart. 
the corrective feedback paradigm works in this way. So here's, here's my first test question. If this is one that I don't get right, I'm gonna put this one back three in the stack. So it's gonna come up pretty soon, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm gonna get, maybe this is a, a red star. I get that one right. Um, I'm gonna put it much deeper back in the stack, right? And now I've got an orange star, got that one right. So I know my stars, we're gonna put those back. Well, now we've brought the red heart back up. This is one that I struggled with. If I get it wrong again, I'm gonna put it just three back. And so when you're looking at a stack of content, this is one efficient way to really just work on the things that you struggle with. Um, visually, the, the actual movement of that card, you know, three back in the stack is also a pretty good trigger um, with, you know, feedback in that, oh, I got that one wrong and I know it's coming up. So now I'm thinking about it a little bit as there's content in between. Uh, and that, that allows someone to take a big stack of questions and really narrow it down to just working on, on the things that they need to work on or, or where they struggle. Um, and when you're looking at a, at a big book and you're feeling like, oh, I gotta cram all of this, um, sometimes we shortchange the stuff that we don't know and we actually spend too much time in the stuff that we already do know. Um, and you know that, that I think is where some of the anxiety comes with, um, especially with the larger exam is that the content's so big and I, I don't really know what I'm not good at unless I go through the effort of taking the, the whole quiz. Um, and so the, the next thing that, that I would say is, you know, our, our, our goal with some exams is just to be really good with recall. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that when we, we see this stem of the question, you know, we can instantly kind of pull up, this is what that means, here's how I might apply it, um, and hopefully trigger some situations where you have applied that in the past. In your note taking, one of the things that's that's really powerful, especially for something like PMI. So unlike college, um, you know, these these sorts of examinations are really are really supposed to be talking about things that you're doing in real life. Yeah. As I'm making notes or as I'm building something for a flashcard, the next thing that I want to bring in is I want to bring in emotion. So you know, whether it's the ceremony of having a meeting or discussing something difficult with a client, as I'm going through material. I want to be able to, in my notes, um, in the things that I'm going to come back and look at later, I, I want to write down things that I felt, maybe attach them to people. So I'm not just trying to pull out a concept um, kind of out of thin air so that I can answer, is it A or is it B or is it C? But you know, I'm pulling from uh, my experience about where that was applied, whether it went right or whether it went wrong, um, and that emotional cue, the things that we saw, maybe even the things that we smelled, Right, those sorts of things can help us aid in, in answering questions. Cool. No, that that's really good. I, just, you know, I've used and recommended flashcards for a long time, but I've never really thought about that process of putting the ones we get wrong sort of three cards back. It makes a ton of sense because they're the ones that we have to keep repeating until we know it. Right. And the idea of is always or it's kind of close to three because you know it's going to come up again. So you you better be noodling on it, right? Right. And stuff we know can go to the back. And in my in my head, I had this analogy. Was it anything like a product backlog where you have the important stuff at the top? And it's kind of, but and also quite different, right? Because um, the stuff you get right, I guess it's like moving it across a task board or something. But, but yeah, anyway, you know, and you, you do want to retire things. So yeah. you know, as I'm working through the stack, um, if I get something right two or three times, I'm going to pull it completely from the stack. I don't need to come back to that. I got that one down pat. Yeah. That then, you know, with the, the cycle of I'm only working, I, the thing that's that I keep getting wrong are going to come back quickly, you know, three or five deep in the stack. You end up working with just a short slice of content and it tends yeah. to be the stuff that you're, you're struggling on. Um, you know, and we're, when we talk about technology aiding, you know, individualized or personalized learning today, I mean, the algorithms to do it can be really very very simple <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't need to use you know super advanced uh, machine learning in order to be effective sure yeah and what about old techniques like highlighting in a book you know um it seems very passive is is it useful or are you better to take your own notes or what's the thoughts around that yeah i i associate highlighting things in a book with mass practice or rereading which we know is a pretty ineffective way uh, yeah. to to study. 
the benefits of highlighting come back up when you're spacing things out or you're going you're going through things over a longer period of time. I just don't think most people uh, do that. Uh, and so we we might go through the book and you know doing something hard um, in the process of study is really important. Um, you know it can't be if if it feels like you're not working at this problem very hard, your learning isn't going to be very durable. It should be a little bit uncomfortable. You should have to put in real effort. Um, and and for me, I feel like highlighting doesn't get far enough down to the root for me of doing something active and really thinking about about putting it in context. Uh, a, a thing that would be valuable, so if you want to go through um, the effort of, of using a highlighter, would be to give yourself some challenge questions that are outside of the book. Hmm. And then, you know, as, as you're going through either flashcards or other places where you've realized that you failed at something, create a set of challenge questions and then don't go back to the book and just reread the whole book. Go back and find the answer that gets you over the hump in that challenge question. Because then now I'm reading for purpose, right? I'm reading to solve this particular problem. Um, and that's a more effective way to, to can you go back to the textbook. In that case, you might use a highlighter so that you can find the answer or the set of answers quickly. Um, but but I'd much rather challenge the student than just say, here's here's the thing that I found that was was important. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that I think that's smart. Uh, and then talking about, you know, moving the card back, um, we're gonna get that again. And it's a little bit like, you know, it gets into that. How do we learn stuff? How when do we forget things and and what's that ideal pacing? Um, right to keep our, our learning going. So can you talk a bit about those forgetting curves and, and space learnings and, and the kind of theory behind that? Yeah, so it doesn't take long for us to, to start losing a skill or, or some acquired knowledge if we don't put it into practice. And so, you know, kind of the, the, the knowing curve might ramp up pretty quickly if you're cramming for a test, but then pretty quickly, if you're not putting those concepts into practice, they're going to decay pretty quickly because you're going to, you know, something else in your life is going to come in the way and it's going to fill that void where cramming <laughs> was before, um, you know, and you're going to get busy on, on those sorts of concepts. So, you know, to be really successful in some of these places, it's important to space out learning over a, over a long period of time and to also space other things in between. Um, so a really great example of that would be, you know, pra practicing an instrument. You know, so I, I played the saxophone for a, a long time in jazz bands and in other places. You know, after a couple, you know, after some period of time, my practicing that same piece or the same combination that I was having trouble with over and over and over again, I'm going to start to get diminishing returns. But if I take a break and I come back to it two or three days later, my performance gains are going to increase because I will have consolidated information in my mind about about that performance where I struggled and the things that were happening before and after. And so we need time for our, our brain to breathe. And that gives us a more effective practice time. Um, so spacing um, not only talks about, you know, taking an actual break from the overall activity, but also taking a break from a content area. So instead of just taking all of chapter one or all of chapter two and just cramming that really, really hard and then moving on to three and moving on to four, it's just like the flashcards, it's good to come back. Mm -hmm. um, and it's good to come back over time. So you might just spend you know 15 or 20 minutes on a concept, take a break, later in, the, later in the evening, come back and do another topic for 10 or 15 minutes, take a little break and then come back to topic number one again. So interleave topics, interleave time, and keep your duration shorter gives your brain the time to kind of process what happened, you know, store it into memory in, in a longer way. And, it, and in some ways it removes our anxiety. When we fail at something over and over and over again, we really get in our heads and think about the failure a lot instead of allowing us to absorb the successes that happened before and after. Yeah. No, that's really good. I'm, I'm doing like a book club um, with some people working through that book. And uh, we're probably guilty of of doing chapter by chapter. And then I, I join them for a Zoom call and, and I kind of grill them on, on that one chapter. And 
and we have practice questions, but maybe it'd be good to also have practice questions from previous chapters too, you know, to interleave some of that earlier content in yeah. there, bring it up again. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, a good suggestion. For sure. Um, and if you've had chance, if you've had a chance to put something into practice, <clears throat> excuse me. So it, you know, in your life, as imagine that you're reading a book and you're taking you know three months to get through that full book. Yeah. You know, in the first month, you might be really excited or intrigued about something that came up in chapter one. Well, if you've had some time between now and the end of getting through that book to actually try to put it in practice, now coming back to Reflector to talk about it in context of some of the new things you encountered throughout that book, um, sure. that's that starts to trigger opportunities for you to really. Um, have a deeper conversation because you've come across some of the consequences of performing it well um, or, or failing a little bit and you've gained some new information. And so the complexity of what you can talk about has grown a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And especially because we cover like mindset and values up, up front. And then as you get in and explore value delivery and stakeholders, um, that really, I'm sure, illustrates some of those mindset and values that we talked about up front, maybe more as a initially memorization, but then we could say, well, this is actually how you, I don't know, um, have participative decision-making or we, you know, we empower the team. Um, so it would be really good to link them back to those, yeah, chapter one values and principles and, and stuff. Yeah, um, it, starts, it starts to mean something different. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Um, and then a lot of the people, of course, are, are you know, wanting to sit the exam and, and they're going to get all these situational questions. And so they they do practice questions. Um, but is that is that the best way to prepare for an exam by doing lots of practice questions or, or are there other techniques that you would recommend as well? Well, one of, one of the things to recognize about an exam is that answering questions is a skill in itself. Yeah. And uh, being really good at answering uh, exam questions, there's there's skills and techniques that you could practice regardless of the content. And um, one of the things that you know we we think about when coming across any performance is we want students to be competent and confident. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, multiple choice questions and others can install in us is a little bit of fear, especially if we've had past failures in exams, just the concept of sitting for an exam can be stressful. And so, you know, the the act of practicing the performance of going through and answering questions is going to be an important part of your journey. But the thing that's going to help you be the most successful in answering questions is that that overall connection to things other than just the exam. Um, so there, you know, we're, we're looking to make links with emotion on the content. We're looking to make links to where have you practiced or put this in place in the past, what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, and trying to link those concepts um, together. If I think back, you know, to my own experience in, in you know, passing PMI's uh, ACP exam, you know, I had been a practitioner for a long time um, and had worked with an Agile team and we had been using pretty rigorous ceremony in our own software development process. But we didn't necessarily, I mean, we were a little bit more loose in the language that we used. Um, yeah. you know, so we'd call things that were domain specific to us when we were talking about um, the software project or the team that we gathered together. And we, so everybody had, you know, we had our own nomenclature around some things. Um, and so one of the things that I was really working hard with as I was working through the book was to, as I encountered particular topics, if it had been something that we had put in practice, I try to write down and link together this concept with something that we were actually doing. You know, and in the cases where part of the exam was talking about different ways, uh, you know, to work together as a software engineering team that we weren't putting in practice, um, then I'd have to think about other things um, that would help me trigger and put those together. Um, but, you know, the thing that's that's going to make stuff durable and and give you long lasting success in using these particular concepts is to practice the actual skills and see the consequences of when you put it in place correctly and when you put it in place incorrectly. Um, and th those are they they differ um, in intent. I mean, so if I'm trying to just pass an exam, there's some things like flashcards um, and the way that I use them 
that I can use to really narrow down and help with that particular performance. But as a professional, when I want the credential to not only be something that I can obtain pretty easily, but I'm going to put this into practice and I want it to be part of who I am, you got to go the next step and and starting to up both apply these particular concepts or match them up um, to where you've applied them in the past. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, if maybe you weren't calling sprint demos demos, maybe it was a show and tell or your retrospective yep. was really just uh, I don't know, a get together and talk about, hey, is this working out? But linking linking some of this terminology back to what you actually do, um, I can see how that really helps make that connection and make it real. Uh, and maybe linking it to when it didn't work so well, right? You get some emotion in there too and, and, yeah. and that can make it more, more memorable. No, that, right. that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, as part of the whole COVID response, um, I, I first found out about Alan Interactions from doing some research around um, e-learning because now I had to take my in-person classes and and I was thinking about, well, do I go online? And uh, I, um, what does good e-learning look like? Because I've, I've sort of, um, like many people, experienced a lot of, you know, video plus question, video plus question, mm -hmm. um, e-learning. And, and when I found... Um, the serious e-learning manifesto um, that that really resonated with me. I got it off to the side here, and it talks about how um, you know serious e-learning has some great it has some great concepts in there. Like, don't assume that learning is the solution. If you've got a performance problem, maybe learning isn't the solution. Maybe it's I don't know attitude or motivation or something else. And it's got right. some other great points in there about. Don't assume that e-learning is the answer. Maybe there's a better way to, to learn. Uh, and, and it was great and liberating because there were so many, yes, yes, you know, this is just what I've, I've found about learning personally and e-learning in general, um, that it really resonated. And it's what caused me to, to reach out to, to um, Alan Interactions and, and figure out. So if we want to get better at learning and especially better at e-learning, um, how do you do that? So. I'd love to know, and this is some this is something we haven't really gone into before. Yeah. In the conversations. Where did that e-learning manifesto come from, and and you know what are some of the ideas behind it? And now, I guess a little while after it's been created, what are the, some of the industry re reactions to that? Yeah, sure. So um, it was put together by a, a group of people that that I know pretty well: uh, Julie Dirksen and Will Tallheimer and Clark Quinn uh, and Michael Allen. Mm -hmm. And they had gotten together at, at a couple of uh, conferences and were really talking about the state of the industry. Um, and, you know, some exper experiencing and voicing some frustration, you know, that we, we've had a lot of really great technology and, and concepts in e-learning come along, you know, from the 60s, 70s, and 80s that just aren't in practice as much as they might have used to be. Um, and that's happened for a lot of reasons. I mean, early on when computer time was expensive, um, instructional design using a computer really required a lot of justification. And the justification really needed to be, this is something that's going to be um, profoundly effective in changing performance. Over time, a number of things made the creation of e-learning or the use of computers in, in learning really, really cheap. Mm -hmm. And the intent then kind of shifted a little bit from, you know, being a, a serious aid in performance um, to something that was just a really cheap medium to pass information. And we stopped kind of thinking about computers as mentors with unlimited practice and more like radios, <laughs> radios or broadcast TV. You know, this is something that we can cheaply and, and quickly push content to, to students. And I think, you know, watching the news and, and listening to people talk about the current K through 12 experience that's going through distance learning, um, that that's that's the way a lot of people feel that that the computers are just being used as radios. They're not they're not attentive to the individual's needs. Um, you know, and there's all sorts of tricks and stuff that higher students are doing. You know, whether you know it's creating some sort of video background so that they can go off and do stuff with their friends and not actually attend <laughs> class and that sort that sort of stuff. Um, you, you know, and and that's really a function of bad or boring e-learning, something that doesn't engage me. And the serious e-learning manifesto was meant to say, you know, here's what we're, here's what those thought leaders 
have been seeing in the industry kind of for a long time that feels like typical run of the mill e-learning that nobody wants to take. It, it's clearly content focused. There were some shortcuts that were made on the author of the contents side so that they could just get something out quickly. And mm -hmm. they weren't really thinking about the student um, at all and their, their world, their experience, what can they do and what they can't do. Uh, and the serious e-learning manifesto is really meant to be a stake in the ground that says, you know, e-learning can be so much more and it can be, it, it really can be a, an enormous aid for an individual, help them practice the stuff in a safe space at their own pace, not in these scheduled blocks of time, but, you know, if I've got 28 minutes or I've got 15 minutes, you know, I've got 90 minutes, you know, kind of whatever it is, the computer can be there for you in whatever time frame is necessary and work with you at, at your pace. Um, so there's e-learning can be a really wonderful, um, wonderful experience for the individual. It can really change performance in a profound way. But but most organizations and most people don't, don't apply it in that way. They think of it more as a cost saver and let's get something out quickly. And um, pe people react pretty viscerally to, to those sorts of uh, applications that, that don't get to being a useful uh, way for a person to spend their time. Yeah, some of the some of the things I found for, on your website uh, that were really exciting were the simulations. You know, so uh, I'm doing a job, um, and the e-learning solution actually simulates that with people's reactions. You know, if, if I screw up and do it wrong, then you know the person has a grumpy face or sponsor confidence goes down, right? But I get yeah. the opportunity to redo that experiment um, with a different set of inputs and, and hopefully get the right output. And, and I think that's where it's really valuable. You know, I go at my own pace. The stuff I understand, I go through like super quick. Um, but I get to practice creating a backlog or um, planning a sprint or iteration. I get to, you know, practice trying to do a demo or something somehow. Um, and then it, the tool gives you feedback, right, based on your right. performance. Um, it, but it's it's more effort to create, I guess. It, it sometimes I think you know when we when we think about typical applications of of e learning, one of the hardest things to do with inside a team is to get your subject matter expert to say stop, <laughs> right? Yeah. And what what we often want to do when we are experts is share all the tips and tricks and secrets that we've accumulated over 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes a performance really just hinges on two or three key things. Um, but what e-learning in a typical application might do is try to tell you 35 things. And then you as the student are kind of then left there scratching your head going, well, what's the most important? Um, you know, so there's there's where we've got opportunities to really gain additional efficiencies is, um, you know, working in a simulation allows us to really just talk about what are the key aspects of the performance, because we need to show that to the student. Um, and then at the same time, um, there's volumes of new information that are kind of required that wouldn't have been in that stack of content or, or in those books, because when you start making a few decisions, the variables of the environment change. And, and that's where a subject matter expert can be really helpful is they can tell you, well, when you turn this knob, this light blinks blue instead of green, right? And that might not have been in, in the manual of, of content. So you know, one of the things that, that we would be looking for in the simulation, especially you know on, on project management and working with other people is really I'll allow the student to go through and make some decisions and see what those reactions would be throughout a, a host of different variables. How do people react emotionally? What what do they do after you know a set of particular events? You know, are they really diligent? Do they work pretty hard in a short burst? Um, do, does it kind of look like they're going through the motions, but then pretty soon do they s s revert back to their old habits? Yeah. Al allowing a student to see the consequences of their actions in that way really starts to cement these sorts of concepts in in a much uh, more profound way um, that that have lasting benefit, and that that is something that that e learning can do. Um, that's you know hard to do in a face to face situation because you can't give um, you know a class of thirty five people that that full experience within an hour. You might be able to allow one person to come up to the front of class and and be the guinea pig, and everybody else kind of 
watch from the side. Um, but the diligence of everybody getting to see the consequences of their actions and getting it, letting them press the button and see what happens, it, again, is important. Um, really great students with with good e-learning like this might might follow this particular pattern. On the first go round, they'll try their they'll try their best. They'll make some notes to figure out where they made some mistakes. Then instead of just being done, they'll go through it again. And they'll, they'll use their notes and say, okay, now I want to get a perfect score. How close to a perfect score can I get? And they'll do it a couple of times that way. Then the next thing that they'll do, especially if the consequences are comical or memorable or kind of visceral, they'll go through it and they'll try to make as many mistakes as possible. Right. So they can, the they can see what happens. Um, and that's a wonderful demonstration of the safety of e-learning mm -hmm. in that um, – you might try things that you would never try things in front of other people, even in a class. Um, and you'd certainly try things that you might never think about trying um, in real life, you know, when you're actually going through the performance uh, and the safety to getting to see some of those things uh, is, is pretty cool. Um, and it also allows people to then become cognizant of the things that they really don't know. You know, so you might sit somebody down who thinks that they're an expert in leading agile teams um, you give them a hard challenge up front and pretty quickly they make enough mistakes and they go, wow, mm -hmm. I, I really thought I was an expert at this, but look, this went off the rails pretty quickly. Um, and then you're intrigued. Then then you as a student, you know, are no longer, you know, in that position of, right, you know, I really know this, but now you might be thinking, boy, there's some stuff I really just don't know. Um, and then you'll put, you put effort into the content. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, this is like super fascinating. Uh, we we said we'd probably talk for twenty five minutes, and I just saw the timer up there. We're at thirty one already. You know, it's exciting where I think um, you know the future will be for for e learning. You know, I, and I try and help people in the field of agile and project management. But I really think it's it's going to help everybody when we get this sort of next generation or better class of uh, e learning tools and and techniques. But all of these, all of these ideas, even the flashcards, right? That are super low tech and uh, and manual, tremendously valuable. So really grateful for for your time today, setting this up and and kind of replaying this conversation we've had over the last few months. Yeah, as I've been trying to get back up to speed. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, we've put up your your website, Mike. Maybe tell yeah. a little bit about how people can get engaged with you if they're they're going through um, their study and prep for uh, a PMI exam. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so leadinganswers.com is my own website. It, it's a small, it's more of a blog, really. It's just me there, but I have my books there. And um, there's, so there's, there's blogs you can read, there's books you can sign up for, as well as I do these supported um, study groups. So people read through a chapter of the book every week, and then we have a Zoom call for an hour, uh, chat about the topics. Uh, and you know now I'll be going back and maybe interleaving some previous content in there as well, and you know, uh, and uh, we chat about stuff on a LinkedIn forum too. And so hopefully I can forward uh, a link to this recording too. Yes, um, for sure. But absolutely, yeah. Go to uh, leadinganswers.com. You can always contact me there. So I appreciate it. Fantastic. That. Well, I, I I've appreciated our conversations in private, and glad that we could recreate part of this for for everyone else who might be thinking about studying for an exam or you know, adding a credential to their profession so that, you know, post COVID times, they can, they can really do the things that they love to do. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure it'll be helpful. Thanks. Yep. Talk to you soon. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.